Have you ever wondered why we've had so much technological progress recently, but the gains aren't widely distributed? Well, today we have a very special episode with Daron Asimoglu that dives into that. It's a history of how different technologies have or have not driven shared prosperity, and then applying those learnings to the gains from AI. As always, let me know what you think of Daron and stay on to the end to hear his overrated and underrated. Thanks. Hello, Reese's Pieces. I'm Reese, the founder of Root. And today, I'm excited to chat with Daron Asmoglu. Daron is a economics professor at MIT who's written excellent books like Why Nations Fail. And he just released a new book titled Power and Progress, Our Thousand Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. Daron, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thanks, Reese. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, excited to dive in. And it's, it's kind of a cool moment because I think we have seen... Um, not only over the last 50 years, it's like, oh, so much technological growth or whatever, but stagnating wages. But also we kind of like taste it in our society these days. It's like, okay, there's so much progress, but what's actually, has that been distributed in society? And so the book kind of dives into all of that in a very delightful and juicy way. And so that's kind of what we'll talk about today is like understanding that, understanding how we can make shared prosperity and all of that. But before we do that, Daron, I want to ask you, what is the through line behind your work? Because why nations fail is kind of an institutional frame. Well, this is kind of like a technological frame. Yeah, what, what kind of, uh, tie, what's the through line between all this? Well, I mean, I think those two are the bookends for my research. You know, I have been excited, perhaps obsessed with institutions and technology throughout my career. And the way I see this book actually is trying to bring the two together and the key argument, actually, of the book is that there's nothing automatic about technological progress. It depends on its direction, and that direction itself is shaped by social forces, institutions, who has political power, social power in society. So that's the sense in which those are really coming together, and there are traces of why nations fail and other institutional work, political economy work that I have done. But But I'm also really excited in this book that Simon and I delve deeper into the future of technology AI and try to learn about these from past technological transitions. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I think it's a cool, well, I love that you say you've been obsessed with institutions. That's that's so true too, where it's like, you know, you just, you gone deep, extractive institutions, inclusive institutions, all just like, you know, the man loves institutions, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, I think whenever... I work on something I think obsessed with is a good good way of describing it's it. It's a good yeah, and it's a good way uh, for people who are listening. It's like if you're not obsessed with it, um don't do it, you know. You know, if you're obsessed with it, well then that's great. It's so natural to you. So so, so keep doing that. Um so yeah, and I love that that inner interaction too where it's like, "Oh, oh, tech is neutral, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's somewhat true and whatever, but it's like, how does it get shaped? Oh, it gets shaped by who's in power, the institutions and the visions for that. Um and so with that in mind, like how do you think about um, you know, what is the, the thesis of power and progress? Well, you know, I think the one major point that we want to communicate is that there is a lot to be hopeful when it comes to technology. But we should never fall into the trap of thinking that technology will automatically bring benefits. And I think things that have inherently conflicting messages are very difficult for people to keep straight in their minds. And a lot of people in economics, in the tech world, in journalism, are drawn to the narrative that, look, we have benefited so tremendously from industrial technology and the application of scientific knowledge to our lives over the last 300 years, of course we will continue to do so. And the point of the book is to say, yes, of course we have benefited from these technological breakthroughs, but there was nothing automatic about the benefits. And for that reason, we go to pains to go through several technological transitions, including the early phases of the Industrial Revolution, to say, actually, it did not have to work out that way. And there were many casualties of progress early on. 
and try to pinpoint what were the formative forces that were both technological and institutional that pushed us in a more broadly beneficial shared prosperity direction. And then that's the sort of the framework. We developed the conceptual framework, the historical reading on top of it. But then we come back and say, you know, which of course is controversial. Some people will disagree with it. Look, we are repeating the same mistakes as the medieval period or the early stages of the Industrial Revolution in the way that we're developing these technologies, who we are allowing to empower, who, who we are allowing the technologies to empower, and who we are allowing to set the distributional and the technological pathways forward. Yeah, yeah, I love that. It's kind of like... Um... Yeah, it's funny. People hard. It's it's like I want to. Isn't is tech either good or bad? Just tell me which one, yeah. one Dar. You know, Dar. You know, and you're like, no. It's yeah, like one all. question that I'm always asked, like not always, but often asked when I talk to journalists or podcasts or interviews. What will AI do to society? What will AI do to jobs? What will AI do to inequality? And my answer is always, it will do whatever we choose it to do. Yes. Yes, exactly. And, and so those kind of intentions. And so t- tell us about that historical lens. I kind of want to bring the listeners through that a bit because you do this great job of, of kind of detailing that. And especially the Industrial Revolution, like in my mind, there's again, there's a there's a narrative that's like, oh, my God, the Industrial Revolution. It's amazing. We're talking over electricity and, you know, all this stuff. Um, but so tell us like how perhaps um, some of those gains were not, um, you know, shared. Yeah, I mean, like. Many of the things that we remember from the Industrial Revolution are, you know, how the world was in early 1700s and then how the world looks like in 1900s. And then it's pretty impressive. Electricity, which is pretty late, you know, trains, amazing. But if you zero in into the roughly the first 100 years of the Industrial Revolution, from around 1750 to 1850. You know, the notable aspects of the Industrial Revolution are textile machinery, first spinning and weaving. Pretty impressive advances, but a lot of it was automating work and did not lead to wage increases. In fact, working conditions worsened. The factory system in general, it was a hellish place, very high discipline, extremely long hours, loss of human agency, quite a bit of soft repression, even in the United Kingdom, where you still had, you know, masters and servants acts and a tremendous amount of power of employers over employees. Coal mines, which is where the steam power was, you know, for the first several decades or 80 almost 80 years you know the main use of steam power was you know not the trains not the machinery but to pump water out of deeper mines which were hellish places where children as young as five or six were working you know sometimes 18 19 hours a day uh repression of labor trade unions are completely illegal people are sent to jail for developing worker voice and you know the whole population of britain shifting rapidly towards cities where the infrastructure completely collapses huge infections life expectancy falls to something less than 30 years in parts it's really not a picture of shared prosperity in fact most likely we don't know for sure but real incomes of working people did not improve even though their working hours lengthened and their working conditions worsened. So there does not seem like the type of hopeful growth process that we're seeing. Now, against that background, if you fast forward another 80 years, it looks completely different. Then you have, you know, railways, electricity, new steel processes, where there is much more training and more skilled work. Education improves, public infrastructure, you know, uh, uh, infections and infectious diseases are brought under control, sewage systems are established. Now we have more of a democratic system in Britain. Trade unions are finally, you know, recognized uh, in the last quarter of the 19th century. And as a result, you also have wage growth and even faster productivity growth. So, it's a very different picture than the first half of the 
Industrial Revolution. And our point is, look, you can see a complete shift here, and there's nothing automatic about it. In fact, the uh, the people who you know control the industrial uh, enterprises and control the political system were extremely set in their ways. They didn't necessarily want to change. You know, Chartists in the 1840s made very mild demands about, you know, political representation and an amazing, you know, before there were even like mass circulation newspapers of the sort that we see later, they collected three, three million signatures and the British authorities in response put all of the leading Chartists in jail and did not respond to any of the demands. So, so there was a really protracted process of institutional change and, we argue, a change in the direction of technology that really made the better outcomes possible. In particular, there was a move away from just automation and you know harsh treatment of labor, things that increased the contribution of labor to the production process. And that was, we argue, quite a significant change. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's great. I think, I think it's a great reframe. Like, you can think about, oh, there's first industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, and it's usually from the technological lens that, that people make that distinction. But I think what you're doing here is saying, no, there's like the jungle, which is the first one, which is just like, you know, you know, death, long working hours, you know, infectious diseases, you know, just being treated like crap, all that. Um, and then with the gains only going to the, I don't know, you can just imagine all those random, like the, this maybe was a little bit later, but like the Carnegie's and Rockefeller's, like all those long names that are so, that many syllable names, Carnegie, Rockefeller. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then later though, we get, um, you know, more wide distribution. And so it's like, okay. And that's kind of the shared prosperity angle. And was it, and how much do you think is it, and I know you go into this in the book a bit, but it's like, how much of that is the technologies themselves? You know, it's like, oh, railways cr created more tasks for more workers and therefore the wages were more distributed versus just pure automation versus how much is it a cultural thing? Or I, think institutional thing? I think both, you know, so and you put your finger exactly on the two key pillars that we think are central and are also the centerpiece of our concept. concept. I read the book. I read the book. I, I just <laughs> I the thanks, book. Reese, thanks, Reese. We're, we're very grateful. Uh, so we say, look, if you use technology just for automation, you know, you're not going to create shared prosperity because shared prosperity has to start in the labor market. Most of us earn our livings as workers of one form or another. You and I may be knowledge workers and there are construction workers, there are nurses, but there's this just general wage process that is really central for that sharing. And if the future looks like that common sort of uh, prediction about uh, the future factory where you have, you know, only two employees and a man, a dog, and uh, the, the, man, the, the man is there to feed the dog and the dog is there to make sure that the man doesn't t touch the machines, you know, that factory is not going to create wage growth because humans are completely dispensable. So that's what automation in its extreme form will bring. So... You need something else. That's, we don't think that's going to be the future. And then that's not the future we want. Why is that? How is that? Well, we want, we're thinking that even things like large language models, for example, will generate new tasks, new things for workers to do. Better work for knowledge workers such as yourself and myself. So those are all parts of those new tasks. So you need this balanced distribution of technology so that there is demand for workers or using the technological the, the 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 technical term you know the marginal productivity of workers meaning the contribution that workers make to the production process is actually improved but even that's not enough if you do that but workers have no voice no bargaining power powerful corporations need not pay them that much more so that's the institutional basis which is of course about worker organization but it's also about broader democracy countervailing powers and like that so both of those are necessary and in history you see periods of non-shared prosperity when either of the two pillars completely collapses yeah i love that yeah so it's like the first one say you know is it is it pure automation or is there also augmentation and yeah. the second one is um where does the power lie and is the does the um can the people just get away with pure exploitation or are they are the the, the gains kind of distributed so i have a question for you though 
do you think that automation um isn't there a version of reality where we get lots of automation and the factory has it just you know it's pumping out teslas or whatever and then the people i don't know we're hanging out on the side and we're just happy that the automation occurred and you know we have food and we have tesla is that is that a possible reality like pure automation reality or what do you think about that well so okay that's a great question how many hours do we have for me to answer that question as central yeah. <laughs> so, okay, uh, 25, no, seconds, me... 25 seconds 25 seconds you know yeah. so so first of all Is that so? So let me let me repeat your question. So, can we create abundance out of just automation, and can we re- distribute that abundance in a reasonable way so that looks a little bit like shared prosperity or satisfactory society? Now, there are a couple of roadblocks onto that that make me think that's not a likely future. First of all, can we really create abundance out of automation? possible, but that really needs to be amazingly good automation. So if we, of course, were to generate ultra-intelligent machines that do everything better than humans, perhaps, but so long as machines are not like at the level of creativity, flexibility, social intelligence, communication intelligence of humans, you know, automation is really is not that easy to get us there. Because What automation is not doing is not really leveraging human creativity and human productivity. So that's one roadblock that can automation really get us there. In the book, we argue that's that's difficult. It's not that likely. But you may not agree with that. So you might say, I actually believe in the capability of, you know, GPT-5 to be almost as intelligent as most humans. And so, yes, automation can get us there. Even if that happens... Then there's another problem. So imagine we generate that abundance. Would we really distribute that in a shared prosperity way? I mean, even today, I don't see much evidence that Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and and others are going out of their way to redistribute their wealth. And in a world in which they control all of the production process, why would they do so? So the, the track record of our political systems to redistribute towards people who don't have an essential role politically and economically is not that great. The second problem with that is that imagine that, you know, you own and design all of the machines and 200 million people in the United, 300 million people in the United States are benefiting from you. That seems like a very two-tiered society. Even if some of your income is redistributed, the social status that you will enjoy and this dependent, subservient nature that we will have because we're eating your breadcrumbs, essentially, even if those breadcrumbs are somewhat generous, that seems like a very dystopic society. And then third, there's a lot of evidence that people lose sense of purpose if they just become consumers rather than contributors to society. So all of these things make me worry that a world of abundance with the modern factory without workers is not likely. And if if it were to happen, it's not going to lead to a happy society. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I think um, I think that's a very reasonable take, given where we've come from. Um, and I do think that, uh, yeah, I do hope that culturally we'll be able to kind of, quote unquote, get our shit together and um, say like, hey, even though there's like, uh, you know, abundance through uh, automation, that we should distribute that more generally. And that should be pushed towards education. And that should be pushed towards things that make yeah. a more decentralized society. Yeah, but, I mean, I, the the way knows, I yeah. would say it is, you know, I think, you know, a lot of... Uh, philosophical foundations of just society are about who earns what, who consumes what, who has access to what goods. But, you know, as Michael Sandel has already started sort of arguing on this, I think that misses a much more central thing about the way at least we are as humans at the moment, which is that we find meaning in also having a contribution and having a recognized contribution to society. It's not just like consumption. And I think that's another part of the problem. 
Yeah, no, I love that. It's kind of like um, we're not just I'm not a pure consumer, you know, like I, I should be reduced to just consumption. Um, so let me ta- let me ask you then about the next stage of history here, which is, I think, really interesting. We have post-war. I mean, this isn't exactly the next stage. We have the progressive era and that was really good. And we got, you know, a Green New Deal or not Green New Deal, the original New Deal. Um, and then but post-war, especially I'm thinking about U.S. right now, it's like, oh, my God, we had like 100 percent productivity growth, you know, and 100 percent wage growth. And mm-hmm. then after that, like. Like 1970, we have like again another 100 percent or whatever ish um, productivity growth, but like no wage growth. So what what's happening in the first you know in those two different things? Where it's like the post war period we're good, but then after 1970 we just kind of totally lose it all. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think the decades you know after World War II are not discontinuous with the past. I think you see many germinal points of those germinal elements of those in the 1900s, in the, you know, new tasks in the factory system, the emergence of clerical work, technical work, design work, uh, and labor's organization through the New Deal and thereafter. But the decades, the three decades, three and a half decades after World War II are really remarkable. They are the fastest growing period for pretty much all the industrialized nations. And again, pretty much in all industrialized nations, you see this, a very shared type of prosperity. Wages are growing, low educated workers are getting more or less the same wage growth as higher education workers. Those decades are really important against those, for example, who say, you know, the market system is doomed to generate inequality. But, you know, what what about those three decades? And in fact, the, the, the 50 years that preceded that as well. You know, there is this very remarkable period where you see things didn't work out that way. But for those who are hopeful about the future, then the big puzzle is, well, why did this end? How did this end? And so Simon and I sort of reinterpret that period through the lens of the conceptual framework that you and I just talked about. And it's really centered on what happened to technology and what happened to the institutional framework. And both of those, we argue, went against shared prosperity. On the technological side, it's the digital technologies, unfortunately. And here, really, our choice perspective is very important because we are not arguing that there was anything inherent in the digital technologies that had to increase inequality, slow down wage growth, eliminate workers. In fact, many pioneers, both from the usage point of view and software, the technologies, hardware technologies, had this hope that computers would liberate people, empower workers, increase the voice of citizens. And they weren't completely wrong. I mean, the pathways that they traced of how this could happen was all quite reasonable. But that's not the direction in which corporations and the tech community push these technologies. So many of the people who sort of believed in this liberating role of personal computer, for example, thought that the personal computer would be the end of IBM because they thought IBM was a symbol of the centralized control of, 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 of computing technology. But instead, IBM went from strength to strength and was joined by Microsoft, you know. Uh, so uh, so that was this direction of technology. And that direction itself was very much embedded in what we call a visions of technology. What do we expect from digital technologies? And it was also institutionally embedded. It happened during a time where corporations became much more focused on improving shareholder value rather than, you know, creating sort of uh, uh, an environment which supported worker training, worker skills, and sharing some of the gains with the workers. This was also at the same time as worker voice was declining because the union movement, both because of its own faults and because of other factors, was declining, and uh, and and the political pendulum was shifting against workers. And these two combined really created a pathway for digital technologies that went much more in centralizing information, eliminating work, automating work, 
improving monitoring of workers. So all of those, I, I think, are very important for understanding for the dimension that uh, that we're seeing. And just to reemphasize, we are not saying that there was anything wrong with the automation. Automation is okay. We want to automate work. But at the same time as you automate work, you want to create new tasks. So we did the automation and we did the creation of new tasks for workers. And that, that's where the problems lay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's like, and it, I think it's funny because I think the tech world in general, um, you know, and for me, more coming from that world, living in San Francisco, being a computer science guy, whatever, it's like, we kind of, uh, you know, we look at that period from the 1970s through the 2020s or whatever, and we're like, oh, it's, you know, neoliberalism was the problem and shareholder capitalism was the problem or whatever. It's like, well, actually, um, yes, yeah, as you're saying, that is true, but also the technology itself and the, the kind of some of the visions for it were to, um, you know, it's like, oh my God, how many, you know, the classic things for Google and Apple and people are, how, what's your amount of of like revenue per employee and like they're so excited to just like put that number up and up and up and you just you only hire a couple of coders and then you just you don't need anybody else you're just Absolutely. making I mean, you know, today we actually forget that period because google and microsoft and uh, you know facebook have become bigger corporations but like you know their their business model was have as few coders and skilled programmers as you can while expanding your market but but even more importantly and now like linking it to ai you know, we think the sort of view that, you know, has its roots going back to Alan Turing of thinking that what you should have is these autonomous, intelligent machines, that your skill is proportional to how quickly you can reach human parity or how many tasks in which you can reach human parity. That's one vision of computers, and, and it's not necessarily the most productive vision of computers. And in fact, many in my mind, at least, very significant breakthroughs like hypertext or the computer mouse or more usable machines or better communication tools, including, you know, the Internet, have come out of a different vision where, in fact, Google itself, where you try to find better ways of boosting human productivity and knowledge using machines. Yeah, and so it's less it's less a pure just like yeah, it's a instead of a autopilot, it's a copilot vision. Um, and so how do you how do you think about Lee? Let's, let's transfer into AI more generally here, which is we have a situation. We had the post war period and the fifty years beforehand where it was good. You know, there was shared prosperity and growth. Um, we had a, a relative balance between the market and the state, or whatever. You know, um, and then after that, we got kind of digital technology and also neoliberalism or, you know, this kind of shareholder capitalism vision. Um, and that kind of took away that just kind of kept everything. Fl- and just to reemphasize that for a second, it is just so I find that just so dis- distasteful or just like all you see you, when you see the decoupling of just like productivity and then you see flatness, you're just like, this is bullshit, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, look, and it's not even good for productivity. Like the way I say it to when I talk to business people. What is labor to you? Is it a cost or is it a resource? If it's a cost, then you try to eliminate it. If it's a resource, you try to increase its productivity. You try to use it better. And which one is going to be more productive? And I think it's going to be better if you actually try to boost the productivity of the resources that you have. So we're not actually even doing well in terms of productivity when we just get obsessed with, oh, yeah, let's co- reduce labor costs a little more, a little more, a little more. Yeah, I love that. I think it's a great frame because like you can even imagine maybe a counterfactual reality in which we didn't have in which labor was seen as a resource. And then the the angle would even be more up into the right or wherever. It's like, oh, the productivity could have even been more if you weren't treating everybody just like a, a, a you know, a, a cost versus resource. So so. So we have that reality. We're in 2020. We had we've had this unfortunate decoupling. What uh, and now we have AI coming onto the scene, which is seems sketchy from a technological perspective because it does a lot of automation, perhaps. And then it also from an institutional perspective, we're still in this kind of shareholder. Like we have no new. It's not like capital gains taxes have increased or whatever. So like so, how do you feel about you know what's going to happen with AI? Are we going to experience a shared prosperity? Well, look, I actually, you know don't think AI should be viewed as an automation technology in general. But I am very concerned because it is div- being developed as an automation technology. So here is a like an extremely potted history of human work. It starts like agricultural work, which is mostly physical, very important mental element, conceptual element, but nobody is doing just purely conceptual knowledge work. 
Then we go to the industrial era where the amount of knowledge work is increasing. And then we are more or less at the cusp of the post-industrial era where we're going to have a lot more knowledge work. There are fewer and fewer blue collar workers and even people who are like electricians or nurses are going to need to use more and more knowledge. So in the industrial era or the agricultural era, you know, the way to improve human productivity is to give them better tools. In the knowledge era, we need the equivalent of better tools for knowledge workers, white collar workers, clerical workers, creative workers, podcast presenters, academics, all of us. And digital technologies can get us some way, but they're rather constrained by their you know, pre-packaged programming way. So AI, if you think of it as a more flexible way of doing this work, has great promise to be complementary for knowledge workers, creating new tasks, new capabilities, better decision-making for knowledge workers. I think that's the promise. But that promise really requires us, we don't think of AI as autonomous machine intelligence. We think of it as, as you said, co-pilot, or what I like to call it like the lick lighter, uh, JCR Licklider's vision, the machine-human symbiosis. And he doesn't mean like putting chips into your brain. It means machines as tools for expanding human capabilities. So that is the great promise. And that's why I'm still retaining a little bit of optimism about the future. And in some sense, you can say, look, large language models have that capability. Look, they could become a resource for all sorts of consumers, users, and knowledge workers to get better information, make better decisions, expand a set of tasks and capabilities that they have. But that's not the way that we're developing them. The promise of generative AI is, oh, you can eliminate your workers, you can monitor your centralized information. Those are not the right ways to go. That's the general argument in the book. Yeah, no, I like that. I think it's a, um, and I like the the tools framing, which is, you know, we had farming and then we had farming tools and then we had, you know, in, industry and then we had industrial tools and then we have um, knowledge and now we want tools for our knowledge, which means yeah, using ChatGPT to prep for a podcast interview or to, you know, do some research or to do whatever, instead of just saying, okay, we're just going to, instead of you and I talking, let's just have a large language model for me and LLM well, for you. And you know, two, two large language models interviewing each other. So, <laughs> so the way, the way we say it, and this is, probably the most controversial thing to your AI or tech audience. The the most radical thing we say, we should abandon the talk of machine intelligence. And instead, we should talk about machine usefulness. So we don't want machines to be intelligent. That's a side side thing. They may or may not be, depending on what that's. But we want them to be useful to us. That is the frame. That's what we should be motivated by. But if you look at the industry, at least as an outsider, I see... The real driving force is, oh, can I really show some impressive capabilities that sounds like humans or looks like humans? I mean, in fact, you know, OpenAI obviously is a super creative company, but I think their biggest achievement is the hype. They created the most amazing hype uh, as like, oh, look at ChatGPT or GPT-4. It sounds like a human and it can write sonnets in the style of Shakespeare, you know. Yes, why, exactly. why is that the most useful thing for humans? Yeah, it's interesting. I think, yeah, and I like that the reframe of from intelligence to usefulness. Um, and, and, and and intelligence might be a, a means to that end of usefulness, right. but but um but the but, but you know, calculator or the GPS system, are they intelligent? No. They're super useful. I mean, I wouldn't survive without a calculator. I mean, not now, you know, we have they're embedded in other things, but they're still calculators. Or the GPS system. I mean, our whole commerce now depends on GPS. They're not intelligent. And so and so so do you have any specific, so I, I've roughly, I, I see this vision and, and all things considered, I, I like, I mostly buy it, um, which is that, yeah, if we can have this more co-pilot-y machine usefulness um, frame on how we build AI, that that would be good. Um, what do you think, I mean, back to the question of the technology versus the institutions versus the vision, you know, is, should we, you know, how do you think this should happen in the next 10 years? Do you, do we, should we have taxes on automation while, you know, non-taxes on co-pilots or, you know, how do you think, what, what, what should actually be done here? Well, that's, that's really the hardest part, but you know, the way I, I like to think about it is first of all, let's agree on the aspiration. That's actually a big step. 
I don't think that we have as agreements on aspirations. And if you know, if more people read our book and some of them agree with the aspiration that we have to push technology in a more human complementary way, create new tasks for workers, empower citizens and workers, create more opportunities and better decision making tools. I think that aspiration will also already act like a uh, a, a big tent in which many different ways of approaching this problem can can be developed. Second, I think a corollary of that is we start changing the narrative. And I think a very important part of the narrative is about, you know, if this is about, quote unquote, democratic use of technologies, better for citizens, better for the common worker, we probably want a democratic control of technologies. That doesn't mean like we all get together and we write the next code in the big algorithm. But society as a whole recognizes that there are many different paths and there should be broader consultation about which paths we want to go. It's like, you know, I'm always said this, you know, I always hear this argument, you know, oh, you need to understand, you know, the, you need to understand AI at a high level to have an opinion on it. I'm not sure, you know, I don't understand nuclear weapons. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't have an opinion on whether we should use peaceful nuclear energy or build bigger atomic bombs. So we can have an opinion on the direction of development of the technology. Then there's an institutional element. None of that is going to be possible if everything in the future is controlled by Microsoft and Google. So so we need countervailing powers. That's going to be worker voice. It's going to be democratic process. It's going to be other competitors to these companies that don't get immediately taken over or crashed. So we need a different sort of institutional and market environment. And then we need to talk about specific policies that make all of this a reality and has a effect on steering technology in a more beneficial direction. So for there, we propose some ideas, but we're not wedded to them. They're proposed in the spirit of, you know, these look like things given our framework that could work, but if you have better ideas, we're more than open to them. Like among those we control, we suggest, you know, much better control of who owns data and whose data you can use. So, I think part of the reason why a couple of tech companies have come to dominate AI is because they are big and they have the most resources, they can collect most data, but whose data are they collecting? I mean, whose data is like, this is most clear, for example, actually, that's like, I think the first postmodern industrial dispute is the Writers Guild of America versus Hollywood. You know, it's all about like all of that creative data that uh, screenwriters and other creative artists have generate it. So who owns that? Can I take that and do a few tweaks and call it a new show? So I think that's going to be a central issue. We also think that a lot of the misuse of the technology, especially in social media and online domains, is related to individualized targeted ads, which, you know, push buttons, emotionally charged topics, misinformation. So we think digital ad taxes are things that you need to talk about. You know, uh, we don't think it's a panacea, but we need to have a conversation about whether companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft are too big. You know, do they really need to cover this whole domain and and also be able to you know acquire all of their competitors and kill their technology? So, so I think there's an antitrust element to this. Then, then you know, these are sort of background factors, but then we need to have more active things so that. The direction of technologies goes in the in the in the right way. So one problem here is actually our tax code encourages automation because we subsidize capital, meaning when you buy algorithms or machines to replace workers, and if you hire workers, we tax them. So leveling the playing field, we, no, I don't think we need to tax robots. If we just level the playing field, that will actually go quite a long way. And we don't think we should be taxing robots. We want, we like automation as long as there are other things that increase human productivity at the same time. So our our vision is not to, to prevent automation, is to have a more balanced technology portfolio. And to contribute to that, there may be room for the, the government to have competitions or, you know, NSF or NIH or Department of Defense-like programs, which, you know, identify users of AI that are going to be more human complementary. Like, for example, in education, should we put more AI in order to replace teachers or create more individualized teaching programs or empower nurses? And the government has got a really 
fantastic role here because it simultaneously funds research and then uses them. That's why the Department of Defense was so powerful in aerospace or 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 in uh, in in computers because it was both steering the direction of technology and creating demand for it. So we can do that for more pro-human uses of AI. Yes, yeah, I like that. It's an interesting there's kind of a it makes me think about I mean, a variety of things, but A is like, yeah, we have this reality. I think the tiered system is correct, which is, you know, can we agree on a shared vision? You know, can we start to create some good shared narratives around that, you know, shared vision? And then and then we can start to think about a balanced institutional set where you do want checks and balances on these systems. Um, and then there's the specific policies, you know, it's like, okay, what should actually happen here? And so I think that that um, kind of stack makes sense. And then I think, and then on the specific policies, it's like, yeah, some of them are just so, so obvious. We're just like, and even someone like ChatGPT, I was just looking at the, um, you know, what their, um, this wasn't actually them, but this was, I think maybe Llama, Facebook's Llama or something, but it was, you know, you can think of this in general. Um, 80% roughly comes through um, common crawl, aka the internet, 80% of the data in, in GPT um, or in these large language models. But then, you know, it's like 5% comes from Wikipedia and 5% comes from GitHub and stuff. And yeah. so it's like the 5% from Wikipedia, it's like that, you know, they're not getting any money back, you know? <laughs> but also like, we don't know this, but, you know, they get input from Reddit and they get input from Wikipedia. Where do you think the wisdom of GPT-4 comes from, Reddit or Wikipedia? <laughs> I think from Reddit, they're learning some sentence structure and some really uh, toxic content. But from Wikipedia and books that have been digitized, they're getting much more of the knowledge that is the basis of the wisdom. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I love Reddit. You know, some redditor is going to come in here and say, "Wait a second, we, uh, I, I, you know, there are some good reds." So, I yeah, think, um, oh, no, there are some. Oh, great no, 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 no. <laughs> so let me take a step back here. So we have this. Um, I think roughly speaking, we got this vision. Technology is not this necessarily this net good for everybody. You need it needs to be coupled with shared prosperity and ways to actually distribute those, create new, be co piloty create new jobs. And also to, with an institutional structure that has these like, you know, the gains being distributed. I want to ask you a question, you know, kind of there's this other side of you, which is the kind of why nations fail, narrow corridor side. Um, and I especially want to talk about Turkey right now. And so Turkey, you're Turkish. Um, and I assume. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah. And so you have a bunch of good threads online about how what's going on with Turkey right now and, and what to do next. So what I don't know. So tell us kind of what's. What's the deal with Turkey right now? What happened in their last election? And um, I don't know, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Well, look, uh, you know, I am disappointed. I uh, thought that this was an election where the opposition had a chance. And I thought that an opposition government, which was a broad coalition in some sense, not quite this fun, <laughs> not quite functional completely, even closer to dysfunctional coalition, but it was a broad coalition. And a coalition of that sort would be a step towards a more democratic Turkey. And in the most optimistic moments, I could even imagine they could do a better job on the economy and avert some of the worst outcomes. So now we're going to have five more years of the Justice and Development Party under President Erdogan. And, you know, what does that mean for Turkey? Well, look, I think democratically, Turkey has taken many steps back. And my hope was that it would sort of strengthen its democracy. I don't believe that democracy is going to completely collapse in Turkey, but it's very weak. You know, you can't have true democracy if the media is not free and the media is completely under the control of government. You cannot have true democracy if you know, uh, opposition parties are sometimes intimidated and that happens. And you cannot have good institutions if the judicial process is completely subservient to the all-powerful president and that has happened. So we're not in a good place in Turkey in terms of democracy, but I don't believe that we're going to see a complete collapse of democracy in Turkey in the next five years. But I do worry a lot about the economy because there are a lot of problems and, and I'm not sure that the uh, that there is any easy solution. And even if there are solutions, I'm not sure that the current government will take them. So so I am very concerned that there will be a lot of hardship for the people. 
Yeah, yeah, damn. It's a sad, I was at a conference recently and chatting with some folks from Turkey and they were like, yeah, there's just lots of brain drain, you know, because everybody's there and they're just like, the inflation is crazy and it's just like, it's a tough sell to stay there right oh, now. yeah, I mean, that's been going on for like at least the last five years, but yeah. longer. You know, you know, 20 years ago, you could see many talented yeah. Turks get their PhDs here or masters here and would want to go back and Today, people who get their education in Turkey are trying to get out. Mm -hmm. So that's that's part of the problem. But but even more, you know, uh, more deeply, people are very pessimistic. You yeah, know, they are worried about the economy. They're worried about what they can say. It's it's going to be another tough few years. Yeah, yeah. Do you think? And you know you know, keying it back into the idea of like extractivism versus inclusive stuff, you know, like extractive institutions and inclusive institutions or extractive visions and inclusive visions. It's this weird situation in Turkey right now, which if I understand correctly, it's just like you can get to this local maximum where you just create patronage networks That's and right. um, use an, an extractive institutions. And you're just like, great, we're not really increasing, you know, productivity or anything very much. We're just going to kind of like pay everybody off. And then, and then as those people get paid off, we'll kind of migrate to this lower and lower local maximum where then you look later and you're like, oh my God, we're not really producing much. And it's purely just like a small pool of resources in this like extractive, like sub network of the larger network. Is that kind of how you see it? Yeah, it is. It is. Look, like, let me give you like three pieces, which, you know, really go along the lines of what you're saying, but also highlight a few more complex issues. You know, one of them is, you know, the Turkish economy has not invested much in technology, has not improved its efficiency much. It hasn't improved what it exports much over the last 15 years. A lot of the growth has come from the construction sector and government, you know, spending and consumers getting more and more indebted because they're not earning much. So it's, it's not a healthy type of growth or it's what they called low quality growth. The second piece that sort of goes into your sort of argument is, as some of your listeners would know, Turkey had a historic, devastating earthquake. You know, really terrible. One of the worst earthquakes of the last several decades anywhere in the world. 60,000 folks died 60, February this year. Yeah. And yeah. Tens of thousands of buildings are completely razed. Yeah. And a lot of that is because of municipal corruption and bad decision from the center, like President Erdogan had a building amnesty, which in, uh, in exchange of payments, buildings that did not meet the code, especially the code that was supposed to insure them against, you know, protect them against earthquakes, they were given a clean bill slate. So, uh, so you might think that people are going to be really upset with the government, but in the earthquake zone, the the president won seventy percent of the vote. How come? Well, because first of all, those are the left behind places that are more conservative, so they're more pro president in general. But he's actually increased his support. How did that happen? Well. AKP has great, you know, the Justice and Development Party has a great ground game. They have local networks and they're like patronage networks too. They've been distributing money, hiring people into the bureaucracy. The, the president himself went there and distributed money. He's promised that they're going to have very rapid building there, new buildings, new houses. And the opposition couldn't just break that. So that's, that's sort of the, the patronage network thing. But the last element of this is there's huge potential in Turkey. It's still a young population. There's some very well-trained people, very well-educated people. There is a lot of uh, room for the general population to increase its productivity. And it's all of that potential is, 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 is just not being realized. Yeah, yeah, Dim. And I think, yeah, that frame of just like, yeah, you have, you know, it's kind of like a weird rally around the flag patronage network where it's like, oh my God. And it's just, a, it's like a sad, it's just like this weird short-term, long-term thing where like the people are like, hey, um, what actually happened is you made these codes bad, which actually demolished the city. But then like in the short term, oh, you get a couple bucks here and there. And so you kind of yeah, vote for him again. So actually, when Turkey, it turns out, you know, because had a really bad earthquake, nothing, not as bad as this one in 1999. And after that, they adopted an earthquake code, a building code that's actually state of the art. It's just that it was the policies <laughs> don't enforce them because of corruption. Yes, yes. Um, so as a final with our last couple minutes here, I want to ask, um, 
one quick question, then some overrated, underrated. The first quick question is, what do you, what advice do you have for ambitious young people who are trying to kind of nudge, and whether technologists or kind of policy people or, or vision makers, to kind of nudge it so that uh, power, that progress actually does um, lead to kind of distribution of benefits? I think that's a fantastic question. I don't have a silver bullet answer, but I think people becoming involved and thinking more holistically. You know, I think if we want a better society, then it is all it is up to all of us to do so. Like relegating our responsibilities to, okay, that party knows the answer or that tech leader knows the answer. I don't think that's the solution. So I think becoming broadly involved and also trying, you know, none of us can have like a life that's so pure that we do exactly what we preach. But, you know, we try to play some role in making that a reality. So if you're a uh, AI researcher, of course, you have to have an, uh, earn a living. You have to establish your reputation. But to say, you know, I have a preference for not working on AI as a way of monitoring citizens, but creating opportunities for citizens. I think that's like a little bit more of a holistic behavior. And same thing as an economist, same thing as a political science uh, person or journalist. I think you can do a little bit more and be part of the conversation. Yep, I like that. Yeah, a holistic perspective and, you know, um, yep, yeah, putting your money where your mouth is or your actions where your ideas are, rather. Um, okay, I want to ask this overrated, underrated thing where I'm going to say a statement and then you'll tell me whether it's overrated or underrated and then one sentence on why. Um, and so do you think that the rise of authoritarian populism, is that overrated or underrated? I think it's underrated for the following reason, that we understand it and we understand what kind of a threat it is in the United States. But I think what we don't realize is that this is going on everywhere around the world and in very different guises, like in Brazil, in Philippines, in Turkey, in Hungary, in the Netherlands. So there's something, and I think it's a general discontent in the population, and it's our failure. Like, it's easy to say, oh, you know, there's some white nationalists or racists or, you know, no, I think, you know, Trump is an awful person, but there must be some discontent he's tapping into. And unless we understand what that is and sympathize with it, I don't think we're going to be able to deal with that. That's the sense in which it's underrated. Yep, I love it. Yep. Um, maybe overrated in the US, but underrated uh, globally. What about um, specifically, like, what do you think about ChatGPT? Is that overrated or underrated? Overrated, definitely. Cool. Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, look, it's quite impressive what it does. But when it's turned into, oh, you know, this is a path to artificial general intelligence, or this is going to improve productivity enormously, then it's overrated. There are good things you can do with large language models. I actually think there are much better things you can do if you change their architecture. And their current architecture is not good. Like, for example, if you really want to be helpful to humans, this black box way of excessive con confidence, you know, this is the answer. I don't have to explain it to you and I don't have to give you references. I think that's not a helpful way. So that's the sense in which it's overrated. Yeah, yeah I like that. Um, it's also extremely highly rated right now. So it's kind of tougher to be not overrated. <laughs> <laughs> so like with that, um, thank you, Darren, for coming on the show today. And for folks who want to check out the book, it's called Power and Progress. Yeah. And if you're interested in um, kind of institutions more generally, check it out. If you're interested in technology and how technology is not necessarily this net good, but like kind of a reasoned historical take on like, how technology has impacted or not impacted economic growth. It's a really good overview of that. Also, if you want to check out Darren online on Twitter, it's really funny. Darren, I, Darren, sorry, is one of the few people um, who has a, he had like a fan account, which has <laughs> um, many, many, which already is, has 162,000 followers. And your personal account just took over your fan account and now has 200,000 followers. But if you want to check him out on, on Twitter, um, it's D uh, Asamoglu, that's A C E. M O G L U M I T at Twitter. Um, Daron, anything else you want to say to our listeners today? No, I'm really happy that I've had an opportunity to talk to you. Thanks for listening and thanks, Reese. This is, was a fantastic conversation. Yeah, thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thanks so much for listening today. If you like the show, please give us a five star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to chat about this episode with the community 
of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks and see you here for the next episode. Bye.